Between 1975 and 1994, more than one million Southeast Asians came to the U.S. as part of this country's largest refugee resettlement program. Many from Cambodia came to the Bronx in the 1980s, as many residents there were leaving. Now the story of the Bronx Cambodians is being told in a new book. I was, I'm a girl who was born in Cambodia, um, grew up in the refugee camps, and raised in the Bronx. Um, and that identity to me, the core of that is being Cambodian. Chaya Chom was a young girl when she arrived in the Bronx with her family. Her mother had fled Cambodia when the brutal Khmer Rouge regime took over the country, killing and torturing millions. The lucky ones found themselves in camps in Thailand and the Philippines. Chom says her mother, who moved from camp to camp, longed to move to the U.S. wanting a better life for her children. And you know, in the refugee camps, we, they, before you came, we came, they showed you videos of what it was like to live in the United States and you know, how to open the television, the refrigerator. So it was an opportunity for me, not necessarily for herself, but for her two children, my sister and I, um, to thrive, because she survived um, the war and violence. In 1985, as part of the largest refugee resettlement program in the U.S., Trump's family found themselves in the Bronx. So this building right here, where the Batambang market sits, was one of the first buildings that uh, Cambodian refugees were resettled into. Professor Eric Tang is a former community organizer in the Bronx and a recent fellow at CUNY's Asian American Asian Research Institute. He's author of the new book, Unsettled, Cambodian Refugees in the New York City Hyper Ghetto. After the 1960s, many of the middle class families moved out of the ghetto, um, were, were pushed out, and left behind were the poorest of the poor. And so sociologists refer to this new era of the ghetto, which is not just racially segregated, but economically, homogeneously poor, as hyper-ghettos. According to historians, 55 percent of the Cambodian refugees resettled in areas that had been abandoned and distressed, not just the Bronx in the 80s, but Providence, Rhode Island, Philadelphia and Lowell, Massachusetts. The 10,000 Cambodians who settled in the Bronx also face poverty, violence, and discrimination. And I recall when I was growing up in the Bronx that my uncle used to always experience violence, always getting beat up and always fighting all the time because he was getting, and he was in high school, so he was a lot older than me. Um, and people, our people getting robbed and living in poor conditions with no hot water when we were resettled into the most um, horrible buildings. The condition hasn't changed. The Cambodians shatter the stereotypes of the so-called model minority. So the Cambodian population here in the Bronx economically reflect what's happening with Cambodian refugees across the country. And that is they maintain some of the highest poverty rates, some of the highest unemployment rates, and some of the highest high school dropout rates in the country. 80% of the population receives some kind of welfare assistance and many in the community continue to suffer from PTSD, the horrors of war still lingering in their every day. We have in the U.S., with respect to our refugee policy, this doctrine of work first or work immediately. It doesn't matter if you just came from a war zone and haven't healed from the mental and physical traumas of war. We want you to get a low-wage job immediately. And there hasn't been much improvement in 30 years. According to the latest census data, 42% of Bronx Cambodians live in poverty. Close to 24% are unemployed. And 62% had less than a high school education. I don't think our U.S. refugee policy is really a resettlement policy. It's a policy that says, okay, here's who we're going to take from certain countries based on our geopolitical interests. But once they're here, there isn't a plan economically for how they're going to be fully integrated and um, develop the social and economic capital they need to secure livable wage jobs for the long haul. Today, the Bronx is a different place. It's still New York City's poorest borough, but crime and unemployment are down and businesses are moving in. While many Cambodians left seeking better opportunities, this part of the Bronx still has the largest Cambodian population in New York and is known as Little Cambodia. Unlike many Asian ethnic communities in New York City, there aren't the kind of normal ethnic signifiers 
that um, you see here in the Bronx for the Cambodian population. Uh, restaurants, you know, mom and pop shops, um, even social clubs. You don't see the signage like you do in Chinatown or Koreatown. And that's because the refugees who came here were largely penniless. Uh, they were not capitalized ethnic entrepreneurs that could then establish what sociologists call an ethnic economy. Because the Cambodian population is shrinking, those still here have to fight harder to make sure their community is being served. One woman who continues that fight is Chom. There's so much opportunity, but there's also, there's so much pain too. You know, I think the Bronx haven't really recovered from the 80s, um, the war on drugs. I want to be part of that recovery. We came when it was, when people were leaving and we're not going to leave. We're going to be part of rebuilding this community. She wants to leave her mark. She has been an active community organizer since she was a teen, and now she is founder of Mekong NYC. The mission is to really organize the Southeast Asian community to stand up for themselves um, through arts and culture, through organizing. This former refugee is raising her family in the Bronx. She doesn't live too far from where she first landed, and she isn't planning on leaving anytime soon. I think the Bronx is amazing. Um, I think um, I would not want to be raised anywhere else <laughs> except for the Bronx because I'm a badass because of that. <laughs>